<laughs> I'm not sure that Cary Grant, do you know Cary Grant? He was this very handsome guy. I'm going to put it more on this. Sidney Poitier, I thought he was very handsome, right? When he was 81, I'm not sure he looked great in a bathing suit. I don't know if anybody looks too great in a bathing suit at 81. What do you think? Maybe these guys look good in a bathing suit. But... Hello, everybody. It's Tuesday, February 27th, and Chapo is coming at you a, a, a day late, but merely to accommodate the travel schedule of yours truly. And, you know, n- nothing to worry, nothing to fear. We are back and joining us in the guest host spot, in the co-host spot today, holding it down once again, is our good friend Alex Nichols from Chapo FIM. A- Alex, welcome back to the show. What's up, brother? The brother is going to work it out today. And uh, so, yeah, like uh, coming to coming a day late here. And I guess I'd like to uh, start today's show with probably the most uh, the, the most dominant story of uh, the news news over the last couple of days, which is the uh, rather stunning act of protest carried out by U.S. Air Force Service member Aaron Bushnell in front of the Israeli embassy uh, a couple of days ago. Um, yeah, I, I don't know where to begin with this one. Uh, I guess I'd just like to begin by saying, uh, paraphrasing something our good friend Dan said as, as a result, as it regards the reactions to this uh, act of self-sacrifice, which is that really talking about this or really anything relating to Israel these days is that I vastly prefer the uh, reactions of insane right-wingers to liberals on this. Because if you read uh, you know, right-wingers, uh, they will say why he did what he did. And basically, they know what they believe in, which is more death for everyone, exterminate the brutes. But I, I found myself uniquely sickened by the uh, liberal commentariat's attempt to metabolize this act of protest, which is basically boils down to um, uh, mental health awareness much and uh, committing suicide is against the rules. I like the people who like, um, yeah, they won't even say what this is about. And they're like, we shouldn't even we shouldn't even allude to this. Because if we get going on this, everyone's going to do it. Yeah. It, yeah. How is that going so far? Yeah. <laughs> what do we have? Like 20, 30 copycat suicides in the last 24 hours? Yeah. That's what I to- assume based on the rhetoric. <laughs> yeah. And, and they're all totally apolitical. It's it's like when Jackass came out and everyone started making their own videos. <laughs> they don't like embassies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Someone did it in, in front of Ecuador. Someone did it in front of Guinea Bissau. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I mean, like talking about this in terms of like, we need to raise awareness about suicide prevention or sharing these videos will encourage other people to kill themselves. And it's like people who are suicidally depressed do not douse themselves with accelerant in front of an embassy and then light themselves on fire. Yeah. Like, this is something- a very, yeah, it's a very specific thing that is like, while. Yeah, I guess suicidal in one light is is not something that's done born out of, uh, I don't know, Yeah, the, the, the usual, I mean, if someone who would jump off a bridge or stick a gun in their mouth. That guy believed that shit. Yeah. yeah. Say no, whatever you want, words, whatever. You can pull yeah. up his medical records, but he believed that shit. Yeah, his last words were free Palestine as his body was engulfed in flames, which is like, to me, like, one of the most stunning things you could, like, I mean, the, I mean, I mean I'm, I, it leaves me speechless, and I guess it just, like, it sickens me to hear like I said, like uh, so, so many members of like the liberal media just talk about, well, anyone who sets himself on fire is certainly not mentally well. And like maybe even if that's true to a certain degree, what does it say about the mental health of people who like can live with the shame and cowardice of just seeing what their country is doing every day and do nothing about it? Or even worse, I mean, I'm doing nothing about it, but I'm saying even worse are the people who see it every day and then find a way to pretend like it's something else. And like, I think that's what like the problem is that like they cannot countenance an act of protest such as this or self sacrifice without you know finding a way to, I don't know, like to to shame the person who did it because like his act shames them. Yeah, it's very similar to John Brown. It's the yeah. same kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, he was a bit loony too. He was a little crazy. He, he was, was kind a of a weird guy. <laughs> yeah. Usually, people who have like, extremely strong moral principles, they don't have smooth lives because you end up having arguments with everybody and getting fired from all your jobs and shit like john brown did and that's yeah. you know that's a choice that every individual has to make whether you're willing to fuck over your life and 
and risk your your sanity and your your financial security. But I don't know. Some people are going to do it, and shout out to them. Yeah, with this specifically, I mean, if you just felt like nothing about this, or you like, you know, you just straight up like don't agree with them, right? It would be so easy to just like either not talk about it or say like, oh, he sacrificed himself for a stupid reason, right? But you would only bring up like these very weird meandering points about like mental health and whatever else or the uh, this doesn't even affect you if you didn't feel like some sort of culpability yeah, at all yeah. this. If you didn't feel like some innate guilt if you didn't like see this and think, okay, if he, like, if he, as a, you know, an American, a guy who served in the Air Force, if he felt that he needed to do that, what do I need to do? Yeah. It's a reaction to the majority reaction being, whoa, that's cool. That guy's cool. And it is, it is biased towards Twitter because journalists are all on Twitter and that's all they talk about. But they're seeing that. That's there's so much of that on their timeline, even if you're a guy who, who writes for the Atlantic and it makes them nervous. Yeah. Like if the majority reaction was look at this lunatic, then they would be like, oh, fine. Who cares? Well, yeah. And then like and also just that the uh, the mentally healthy response to uh, watching your government, on, you know, partake in a genocide is to just compartmentalize it in your brain and go, ooh, not a good look. But all, let's all please still vote for Biden. Trump will be worse. Like that. That's the mentally healthy response to just seeing atrocity every day is just going, is there really anything I can do about it? And uh, I, di- I did really appreciate the people who brought up the fact that suicide is illegal. <laughs> I was really just one of those things yeah. that, like uh, when you learn as a kid, you're like, it, it just doesn't make sense. You're like, OK, so, it, so if suicide is illegal. I think you should arrest the people in the person's life who, drew, who drove them to it. I don't think you should tell someone not to kill themselves. It's their body. That's my honest opinion. Yeah. Like, I, well, I, I'm i not going to tell you what to do. I mean, that's the, you do it if you want. And I guess, like, the other, like, the other astonishing thing about this act of protest was, like, in the video itself, the um, Secret Service agents or cops who had their guns drawn on him as his body was engulfed in flames on the ground. Like, I mean, doesn't that, doesn't that kind of sum it up? They were like, drop the weapon! Drop, <laughs> drop the fire! Drop the fire or we'll shoot! And also... For, for all the, the people in the liberal media who are talking about, you know, mental health awareness or whatever, if this was a Russian soldier who did it to protest the invasion of Ukraine, he would be on the fucking cover of Time magazine. They would have him on T-shirts today. He would be being hailed as like a, one of the greatest moral heroes of our time. But like, I mean, they can't do that because like they cannot square the circle of the horror that Biden is carrying out and the, their complicity in it. And like they just they, they need to find a way to ignore or continue to ignore or pretend like this has anything to do with, with them. What if it was a Russian woman and she pulled her tits out and she was on fire? <laughs> <laughs> they would love that. They would go for that so hard. Like if the bottom half of her was on fire and the top half was her tits out. <laughs> that would be the ultimate protest, I think. But bring down Putin. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, One of the most fun discourses. But yeah, I mean, love like, hearing I, about that. It's almost as fun as October 7. <laughs> just reading Twitter all day, just having your stomach sink further and further down as you go. But yeah, I, I, I don't expect this to inspire a, a raft of uh, copycat, uh, su- you know, suicides because like, you know, like no copying yourself. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Copy. <laughs> talk about something being illegal. Don't fucking copy. <laughs> don't copy anyone. Yeah. You Someone comes to school with shoes. You don't get those same shoes. Yeah, if you think suicide is illegal, wait till you start copying. That is the only thing that America has, um, you know, we punish people generationally for. If you see someone that lives in one of the Dakotas, it's because their ancestors copied. (laughs) Yeah. John Lennon, he got he got killed walking out of that for copying. He stole that Chuck (laughs) Berry song and he got he was a phony. He was a goddamn phony. He also stole Chuck Berry's innovations on bathrooms. (laughs) <laughs> he would never pee on somebody <laughs> he would never do that to a woman <laughs> only other stuff unless she was on fire unless she, <laughs> unless she was on fire yeah yeah that would be a cool um, yoko ono art project i just found out about the one where she's just filming his like half hard dick for 40 minutes you could they uh, have so much fun yeah. they really did they had a great time yeah 
people like got upset about that. Like people were like, come on, lady. But it's like doing that in the 60s when no one like knows what art is. And they're like, I guess I have to watch this guy's cock for 40 minutes. That it takes funny. a lot to piss off the hippies to be yeah. too far out for them. You got to respect that. Absolutely. But, you know, like uh, in, in light of uh, Aaron Bushnell's protest, you know, I just want to make it clear. I am not um, advocating um, ending one's life as an act of protest unless, of course, you do work in the Biden administration, State Department or U.S. government. In that case, please have at it. And uh, just to, like, to slightly segue, I'd like to talk about um, another act of protest that's been going on inside the White House. This is something we've talked about before on the show, but it just keeps getting covered in the news. It's, it's still a problem. Headline. Secret Service had to adjust tactics to avoid bites from Biden's dog. This is by Peter Baker for the New York Times. He's like their number one White House reporter. And commander, major, whoever the Biden dogs are now, um, battleship, um, tank, uh, they're, they're still biting people. And I can't help but think it's like on some, you know, in some sense, dogs can just sense evil. And I think that's what they're doing here. And, you know, if a dog could kill themselves, I think they I think they probably would have already. I would have found the big pile of Hershey's kisses and uh, <laughs> uh, self-sacrificed in protest of what's going on uh, in the world right now. But I just like to read in the article here. It says here, the Secret Service had to adjust our operational tactics to protect President Biden because the first family's dog kept biting agents, including the one who required six stitches and another whose blood spilled onto the floor of the White House, according to newly re- released internal emails posted online. The agency recorded at least 24 biting episodes between October 2002 and July 2023 involving Commander, a German shepherd who became the terror of the West Wing, Camp David, and the president's homes in Delaware, about half of which required medical attention, according to the documents. Commander was banished from the White House last fall to an undisclosed location. The recent dog bites have challenged us to adjust our operational tactics when Commander is present. Please give lots of room, staying a terrain feature away if possible. Well, it happened at Camp David. Yeah. There isn't plenty of room there. They brought him upstate and let him run around, and he's still biting people. Yeah, it's every a giant turn- open field. They say, go, 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 enjoy the world. And he just turns right around 180 degrees and starts biting people. Yeah, Every I Secret mean, Service think, agent think, is think, issued a tennis ball. I, th- I think <laughs> we need to like look at the fact that this dog clearly loves being in a very enclosed office space and just attacking as many people as possible. It's neurodivergent. Yeah. And that's its special interest. <laughs> I think it just wants to do that. It has a very specific routine. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I feel like uh commander, his life is like a roguelike. He just has to keep <laughs> seeing how many people he can bite in one room and he just has to do it over and over again. He might have been a corrupt official in his past life. You know, he might have done something that caused him to be reincarnated as a bad dog. It's It's also a a roguelike for Joe Biden because it's randomly generated for him every time. It's the first time he's seen it. (laughs) Wait, wait, wait. I need to look up when did James Trafficant die and when did Commander the dog uh, get get come into the come into existence. We need to look that up. Uh, Just going on here, it says the cache of emails not only documented various episodes and sometimes graphic detail, but also captured the trauma and concern among Secret Service agents and officers who shared techniques for the best way to avoid getting hurt. Secret Service personnel were bitten on the wrist, forearm, elbow, waist, chest, thigh and shoulder. One was saved from injury by his ammunition pouch. Among the documents was a photo of a torn shirt. I was in shock that the incident occurred, wrote one special agent who was attacked while holding the door for the president on October 2nd, 2022, as Mr. Biden took commander out onto the South Lawn. The dog grabbed the agent's left arm and stood on his hind legs. He is literally my height standing, the agent wrote. Fortunately, the doctor found no puncture wound. After this, I was concerned about him getting out of the residence being or being out without a leash for others' safety and mine. That is crazy. The dog is just standing like problem. a human. The dog just stands up to bite people. <laughs> yeah. I think this is a reincarnation situation here. It bites yeah. their neck like a vampire. Can they not just get a chihuahua? Would that be admitting defeat? Like, could they not just get a small dog? Joe Biden. I've seen way better behaved dogs that have a muzzle when they go out for a walk. Yeah. Joe, Joe Biden can't do that because like anyone else in this situation, right? 
like they would make it so like uh you know you never even knew that dog existed they would erase all traces of them having a dog oh but if obama's dog bit people he would Obama. bite him back. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he would be, you know, he would, that dog would be on a spit roast or, or, or killed otherwise. I don't know. But with Biden, remember those texts that Biden had to Hunter where he's like, I love you. You're my sweetie baby. You're the most perfect apple of my eye. That's and how old all- guys treat dogs. Right. That's how my grandpa right. treats his dogs and everyone complains about it. Like he just it, those shitty little dogs go around and yap and bite people and piss on the floor. And he just picks them up and says, oh, my little baby. Oh, my yeah. little baby. Exactly. <laughs> See, exactly. exactly. Like they just yeah. they don't have it in them to discipline anyone. Like they, exactly. You get it out on your kids. And then by the time you get the dog and you're old, it's like, oh, I couldn't I could never do anything to you. <laughs> jo- Joe's Joe's only surviving son is like 53 years old and he's like this is the time in rehab that's really gonna take and joe is like absolutely do you need money for your 12th paternity suit my lovely sweetie honey there are all these pictures of him kissing him on the lips it's the same thing he and he a guy like that cannot get like a labradoodle he needs the biggest dog in the world, and it needs to be horribly behaved. <laughs> I don't know. You could get a pretty badly behaved Labradoodle. They're big ones. One of the ones that's like a standard poodle. And if I've... you don't train them, people, I don't know why people hate Labradoodles so much. My parents have one. It's very well behaved. It's not the Labradoodle's fault. They're overbred, but they are like, if you just do the, just like the bare minimum of good training, they are the most uh, sweet and pliant dogs. Poodles can sense weakness. <laughs> there are no bad dogs, only bad owners. Well, I mean, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Hunter Biden, and I, uh, here's another story from Axios. Exclusive, Hunter Biden sees his sobriety as key to keeping Trump from winning. Uh, it says, Hunter Biden knows this. He told Axios in a rare interview, he sees his continued sobriety as crucial not only to his life, but also to ensuring Donald Trump doesn't return to the Oval Office. Most importantly, you have to believe that you're worth the work. You'll never be able to get sober, but I do often think of the profound consequences of failure here, Hunter said. Maybe it's the ultimate test for a recovering addict. I don't know, Hunter Biden said. I've always been in awe of people who have stayed clean and sober through tragedies and obstacles few people ever face. They are my heroes, my inspiration. I have something much bigger than even myself at stake. We are in the middle of a fight for the future of democracy. To which I got to say, that's probably too much pressure to put <laughs> to place yeah, on your ongoing yeah. society. But, but also... I would have to argue directly against Hunter's point in this case to stop Trump from being president. Hunter needs crackhead strength. Like he needs, he needs to get geared up. He need, he need, he needs that focus and intensity that only comes through cocaine. Look at yeah. Don Jr. Yeah. Him yeah. in 2016, he was yayed up the whole time. He grinding his teeth. He still is to this day. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah. it didn't keep him from losing. I, I don't think that's relevant at all. It doesn't matter if your son's doing blow. I, I have to say to Hunter, like, even just to take some pressure off, I don't like swing voters are stupid, but I don't think there's like a statistically significant amount of them that were like, I was going to vote for Biden. But then Hunter slipped up and had some wine. Like so many not- people have a son like that. Yeah. <laughs> the median yeah, just- suburban voter, they all have a son like that and they don't hear from him. And yeah, he shows up in his big jinkos and asks for money and. You know, he brings your car back with no gas in it. You're like, how did you even get it here? <laughs> how did you get up the driveway? <laughs> that's the kind. Of, that's the kind of stuff. That those are the kind of feats that you can only accomplish if you were just like yacked up twenty four seven. Yeah, yeah. It, that's yeah. the you kind have to know how to ride the focus. gas and the brake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I know where the hills are. Yep. You yeah. use the momentum of the car going down the hill to get it into the driveway with on in neutral. That type of son is, you know, they're the only person that can get places by walking on the shoulder of the highway. 
uh, uh, you know, you know, like the, the, there are those laws now that like prevent people from handing out water at like polling locations in uh, Georgia or whatever. Yeah, I think like uh, Hunter Biden will get arrested for that on the campaign trail, but it's just simply that he's walking somewhere. From, <laughs> no, he's just not. In the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's just carrying uh, like a shopping yeah. bag full of pills and like pushing an empty stroller <laughs> down the highway. Yeah, with, with a guy like Hunter, if you see him walking, relapse relapse yeah. habit <laughs> so, th- so so that's hunter but uh m- moving on but like to, to stay in the biden white house so like over the last couple of weeks we've talked about like ever since um uh the special prosecutor declined to prosecute biden for his own document fuck up because simply he's uh too old and forgetful to have a jury uh, actually convict him of it and then of course getting on tv multiple times and mistaking the current leaders of our major allies with dead people um, and just generally his mental fitness for office has become an issue that Democrats feel the need to uh, address. And they've addressed it in a number of ways. Uh, the foremost being everybody stop talking about this. It's not an issue. I don't talk about it. Nobody mentioned it. But number two, I thought the way that that's their surrogates in the media. The Biden White House has taken a different tack to demonstrate Biden's mental acuity. And that is basically seeding the media with stories about how good a lay he is. Wait, where's oh, yeah. that? Headline here from uh, Biden told AIDS, good sex makes for a long marriage. Unless she dies. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I mean, that doesn't count. We don't know how long that would have lasted. Like, presumably, Nyla Hunter did not die because, like, she didn't get into a car crash because Joe Biden was giving two-star pipe. We don't know that. Yeah, that's true. Well, I mean, I we think that's why one or the Republicans other, need to subpoena uh, uh, Biden's um, dick game. He needs to demonstrate in a closed door session. But it says here, uh, this is the Hill. After 47 years of romance with First Lady Jill Biden, President Biden revealed his secret to a happy and long marriage. Good sex. Uh, Going, it says Rogers recounted how Biden, then a senator, decided not to launch a presidential challenge against former Senator John Kerry in 2004, thanks to his wife's persuasion. According to reporters, she wrote that Jill Biden entered a meeting with her husband and aides sporting a halter top with the word no written on her stomach. Ooh, sexy. In 2006, Joe seemed more interested in staying home with Jill than in running for the presidency, Rogers writes, and he said as much to a group of supporters that year. I'd rather be at home making love to my wife while my children are asleep, he said of interest in the job. So like, Back when it would have made sense for him to run for president because his brain was still all there. He was too busy fucking his wife, which is wait, what year was that? This is a 2006, 2004. His His children were asleep. His (laughs) kids were like, his Hunter's never asleep. We just established were older than me. Yeah. His youngest (laughs) kid was like 28 at the time. Even (laughs) if they're home, like you think a hunter doesn't know about sex. That's not even his mom. That's his stepmom. <laughs> I don't like, like he's, he's tucking Hunter in at age 39. Hunter is wearing like a, he's dressed up like the sleepy time bear. <laughs> That's probably how Hunter got on all the drugs. Joe he's was Buster Joe. Bluth. If he was cool, <laughs> we have unlimited juice. <laughs> This party is going to be off of the hook. G- Joe is dosing him with like promethazine and codeine so he could go to sleep at eight so he could fucking just shoot ropes into Dr. Jill. Giving your son a shot of brandy to put him to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Hunter's teething again. Time to get out the whiskey bottle. Um, but like, I know th- this goes on. This isn't just in the hill. Like I said, I think this is a coordinated media strategy to like let everyone know that how good at sex Joe Biden is. You're like, could a senile man still be laying pipe? I, I don't. I think not. Uh, this is a Maureen Dowd of the New York Times from over the weekend. Sex in the capital city. She writes. The Golden Bachelor showed that sex is not just for spring chickens. Hearing aids and making out in a hot tub can go blissfully together. Now comes the Golden President. Even though fretful questions about his age have engulfed Joe Biden, one thing is clear. His romance with Jill is still crackling. I have observed that myself. At a party at his house at the Naval Observatory when he was vice president, he told me about the frisson of the frisson of watching his wife come down the stairs dressed up for a special occasion. They have been married for decades, he said, but my heart still goes pity pat when I see her. What like what is the alternative to this? Like, is this like are is he supposed to like hate his like did everyone expect him to be like, 
Yeah, my wife's a big old bag of bones. Can't even get I hard mean, to I, her. I hate her. I think this is um sort of like drawing a contrast with uh, Republicans because, you know, like Donald Trump, I don't think he's spoken to Melania in probably two or three years now. Mike Pence infamously refers to his wife as mother. And just like they, they generally don't give the impression that they're still that they're still their 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 their, their cock still gets hard for their uh, spouse. Newton Callista though. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, you yeah. can tell. Yeah. Oh yeah. Tell. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Newt, Every Sunday yeah. they're at the golf course putting in nine holes, if you know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Oh, 18. Or eighteen. Yeah. My favorite couple, uh, Mercedes and Matt Schlapp. That oh is yeah. A, Mercedes is a ride or die. I love her. There's a new news story out every day where some Republican 24 year old is like, Matt Schlapp gave me a ride to the bus station and tried to put his entire hand in my asshole. <laughs> you know, Matt Schlapp. He tried to Matt, use me as a puppet. <laughs> Matt Schlapp dressed up as my air mattress so I would lay down on him. Match like you know, Match Lab did all the Match Lab tried to jack me off. At, uh, he wore a dress and tricked me into marrying him, and I only found out at the altar. <laughs> yeah. like all, all these stories are coming out, and Mercedes, like, clearly, this is a, he's a, a gay man and a predator. <laughs> and Mercedes is like, I'm against these people trying to cancel my husband. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, that's yeah. what this is. He does what he yeah. has to do, and he comes home, and he's very polite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the eight, the, eight, I, I, the eighteen year old CPAC intern who's now um, trying to cancel him for uh, Matt reportedly uh, asking to show him his Kermit the Frog routine. <laughs> uh, going on with uh, uh, Marie Dowd, though, it says here the amorous Biden marriage is chronicled in a new book by Katie Rogers, a New York Times White House correspondent, American Woman, the transformation of the modern first lady from Hillary Clinton to Jill Biden. What's that transformation? What is that? How <laughs> well, has it I mean, changed? <laughs> well, we went from a first lady who doesn't have sex with her husband to one who does. I guess so. Uh, it says here, parenthetically, Rogers notes, Joe may have tamped down his public bedroom declarations winning the presidency, but he has joked to aides that good sex is the key to a lasting and happy marriage, much to his wife's chagrin. Biden's aides were accustomed to his TMI outpourings. The most famous profile ever done about him was Kitty Kelly's Washington piece in 1974, a year and a half after his beautiful young wife, Nelia, and baby daughter, Naomi, tragically died in a car crash at Christmas time. Nelia was my very best friend, my greatest ally, my sensuous lover, he said. The longer we lived together, the more we enjoyed everything from sex to sports. In an office with 35 pictures of Nelia, he pointed out one of his beautiful millionaire wife in a bikini, noting, she looks better than a Playboy bunny, doesn't she? He said he was so exhausted from campaigning for the Senate in 1972, I'd come back too tired to talk, talk to her. I might satisfy her in bed, but I didn't have much time for anything else. What a beautiful memorial. What is this supposed to do? Like I said, I think this is to counter the, the, the idea that he's too old to be president. But this is he's talking about 1972. <laughs> yeah. Well, I doubt that, that you had package. sex in he's 1972. A, <laughs> he's a very generous lover and still remains so to this day. I personally, yeah, and, and I believe that senile people can jack off and come and fuck their wife as good or probably better than anyone else. Why is that? Because it's new every time? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> every time it's a one night stand. Yeah, well, if you're senile, if you're senile, it's probably like, if you have a more like artistic personality, let's say, it's probably like living the movie tree of life. Yeah. Or 50 first dates. Every guy wants to be Adam Sandler at 50 first dates. <laughs> One of the two. One of the two. That is. Well, and, that and, is in this the... case, Joe Biden would be Drew Barrymore in 50 first dates. Oh, yeah. yeah. The lucky one. Yeah. <laughs> uh so yeah, uh, uh, whether you know whether this will stop the dog biting or the Holocaust going on in Gaza, I don't know. But you know what? Like, sort of similar to his relationship with Hunter, I find Joe Biden's ongoing horniness for Joe Biden to be actually one of the more endearing parts about him. So, like, whether this is going to help him, I have no idea. But you know what? Good, good on you, Joe, for continuing to be horny for your wife. In marked contrast to Republicans. Uh, I, got, I got one more story before we get to the reading series today that also touches on the horniness of uh, Democratic politicians. In this case, Elizabeth Warren. This is from The Hill. 
Warren says The Rock would be in her dream blunt rotation. Okay, I was I thought for a second this was going to be the one about horniness, and I just kind of <laughs> winced when you said Elizabeth Warren. I was like, oh, no, she's not going to talk about her fucking husband, and they're like drinking uh, no, Michelle yeah. Ultra and, and fucking each other. <laughs> he felt me up. Sex. Oh, I'll continue. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Elizabeth Warren's dream blunt rotation consists only of Dwayne The Rock Johnson, according to a recent interview. Pod Save America host John Favreau asked the Massachusetts Democrat to choose four people out of a list he provided to join her in a dream blunt rotation, which he identified as a group of people you'd hypothetically like to smoke weed with because they'd be a really fun time. All I'm really telling you, this has nothing to do with weed, Warren jokingly responded. It's who you think is fun. There are people you'd go get pedicures with. This is what you're telling me. Favreau then went on to list President Biden, Vice President Harris, Senator Bernie Sanders, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, and Senator Senator Ed Markey as possible members of a hypothetical marijuana smoking session before getting to Johnson, the actor and former professional wrestler. That could kill some of those people. <laughs> Dude, Janet Ed Markey yeah. is like 85. <laughs> I'm sorry, Janet Yellen. Is Janet like Yellen, a cool hang. You could not find worse people. Like <laughs> this is, Kamala like, might be the coolest person there. Yeah, I yeah. would. Uh, yeah. I would want her in my blunt rotation. Yeah, I want to hear her like, high and just saying her stuff about the coconut tree. Yeah, Kamala, Kamala like, is it, the only great choice there. Yeah, like um, she would say something hilarious about how much dust there is on the ceiling fan and how that symbolizes our lives. But like, if Ed Markey or Janet Yellen have ever smoked weed in their life, it was probably like sixty years ago, and they were smoking straight dirt. So I would like to get them in a room and like give them a dab rig and have them hit like ten thousand percent THC shatter and see what happens. That would be fun. You're kind of you're babysitting a room of old guys who are hitting real weed for the first time, <laughs> and they're all just going to freak out. Yeah, it's the worst they, possible night to have. It sucks. Ed Markey is going to like get. He's going to smoke real weed that isn't oregano, and he's going to be like, "Oh my god, I voted for the Iraq War," and he's going to fucking break a coke bottle and start cutting it will be terrible the worst trip of your life i like this is this related to like liz warren's like thing with the show ballers yes yes it, yes it oh is. yeah yes it is so it oh, says here God. um at the mention of johnson warren said oh the rock i'm stopping there she said she would just choose him four times when Favreau noted he also had Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi, rapper Snoop Dogg, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, and pop star Taylor Swift on the list, Warren stuck with Johnson. I'm still with The Rock, she said. Who doesn't like The Rock, Warren told Entertainment Weekly at the time. And I have to say, who doesn't love The Rock's wardrobe choices? Don't they just knock you out? Those vests and the pink shirts. Oh, man, it's eye candy. In 2018, she tweeted a what? photo of the script of the television show Ballers to say she keeps it on her desk and was signed by Johnson, who she says reminds her to stay balling. A year before that, Johnson said she, he can't wait to meet Warren. Man, that's so weird. That's such a great mix of low and high culture. Where she's doing, <laughs> she's talking about an HBO series and uh, prestige television and all this this Harvard professor type shit that's that would play with her fans. But then she's also talking about how much she loves the rock and she would want to smoke weed with the rock. Like she's talking like, like a guy you would work with at the gas station when you're 19. Like, man, I fucking, if I could smoke weed with the rock, man, like he would be so fucking cool. Like he would be like instantly in my dream blood rotation. Him and fucking John Cena and a Hulk Hogan, like all of them together, they would have like the greatest fucking conversation of all time. <laughs> Like, I'm yeah, man, that's what, I, I got to go back to the register. I, I'm surprised Elizabeth Warren shows smoking a blunt with The Rock over having dinner with Jay-Z. But, you know, I guess she, she's already wealthy enough. Doesn't need any business secrets. But I guess like I'm just a little like, I think it's really funny to choose The Rock as like your sort of sex fantasy object because I can't think of a man more neutered in his public persona than Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Yeah, The, the Rock is one of the weirdest celebrities. Uh He's like an alien. Yeah, he's like an animatronic of himself. Yeah, he is just like he is a device for selling products and nothing more. Well, just best of luck to Elizabeth Warren. I mean, and also like I, I like the idea of, of, of that it's specifically smoking a blunt, smoking a blunt, which I think would melt the lungs of, you know, for instance, Nancy Pelosi or Senator Chuck Schumer. Yeah, that's a you lot. Imagine, yeah, could you imagine how hard they'd cough? 
a free roll the would blunt. be pushing. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's a more more relatable uh, behavior here from Elizabeth Warren. Does she still have that big dog? Bailey? Uh, Who's that Bailey? big dog? No, not the actual dog. The, the big... Oh, the blow-up. Oh, the inflatable Bailey. Oh, Someone they, must have what? that. They, they should hook up oh. the inflatable Bailey to like uh, a fucking vaporizer, like like a, oh, a, blow up a huge oh, yeah. bag. That's a great idea. Mead. And the rock can take a yeah, giant the rock hit can off take it. One hit off of that, and yeah, go Super Saiyan mode on on Elizabeth Warren's pussy. It should be in her yard. Yeah, if you have yeah. that, there's no reason not. For, I am referring, of course, to the new inquiry article about Bovine Barry's University of Austin, and like I, I feel a little guilty with this reading series because it really has done all of the work for me. Like unlike most reading series, this is an article that I think is actually really well written and hilarious. So like I don't know how much more I'm going to have to add to this hilarious account of the, the dangerous courses being offered at Bovine University, but I think it's worth diving into. So, gentlemen, this is. An American Education, Notes from UATX by Noah Rawlings for the New Inquiry. It begins like this. Many of the founders had participated in the same conservative think tanks, the Hoover Institution, the Manhattan Institute, the American Enterprise Institute. Many had contributed to the free press, the digital paper founded by Barry Weiss in 2021, the same year as University of Austin was announced. Many were friends or fans of Jordan Peterson. One University of Austin founder was even double dipping, delivering lectures at both University of Austin and Peterson's forthcoming Peterson Academy. One had been fired for, from Princeton University after sleeping with a student and discouraging her from seeking mental health care per an official university statement. One had been accused of assaulting his girlfriend. The charges were dropped. Another had a talk at MIT canceled after comparing affirmative action to, quote, the atrocities of the 20th century. And so, beneath their optimism, they churned bitterness and indignation at their mistreatment by the thought police, sour feelings they sweetened with their commitments to a free and open inquiry. To build a university, you need money. But the founders were so eager, they were so ambitious and impatient, they wanted students in classes now. So in the summers of 2022 and 23, University of Austin established week-long programs where students at other institutions could attend seminars and lectures by world-class scholars and knowledge creators, a sort of anti-woke summer camp, title Forbidden Courses. The University of Austin is not in Austin, not yet. It's 200 miles away in Northeast Dallas on an office complex owned by Mr. Harlan Crow. So right off the bat here, uh, University of Austin, Texas is not actually in Austin. It's, at da it's in Dallas. The building is the Reichstag. <laughs> <laughs> you brought uh, it over. Uh, Felix, I, I noticed you, you noticed this guy. This, this, this is one of my favorite encounters in this article. So it says here, um, Peter sat next to me on the bus. He was fired up. He was delivering opening remarks later that, not, that night. Plus, he, we'd begun talking about a subject that interest him, interested him, exercise. It's indispensable for an intellectual, he told me. You should be exercising. Do you? I'd recently started going to the gym, I said. He looked doubtful. You got to get into jujitsu, man. I'm telling you, Peter did jujitsu. It changed his life. He'd spun around in his seat, scanned the rest of the bus, and then whipped back to his laser eyes, whipped, whipped back to his laser eyes on me. I could murder everyone on this bus and nobody could stop me. It's a superpower. Oh. I thought this over. So yeah, Felix, as someone who studied jujitsu, could you please tell us about the, the superpowers it gives you to murder anyone on a bus? I, like guys like this, and by like this, I mean people who have done jujitsu for two months and have, in that time, uh, learned like one shitty cross choke and can take that, could do a takedown on someone if they're being allowed to. They love doing this where they're like, guess what? I've just learned the secret to fighting. I know how to fight in the ground. No one else knows how to, only I do. I'm one of the 0.1% of the world that knows this. The ground is an ocean. I'm a shark. And <laughs> like, it's, it's like, okay, maybe in 1991, that might be something when no one knew what this was. But even then, like, what do you think? Do you think that someone is just going to let you 
uh, Peter Baguzian uh, hug them and drag them to the floor extremely slowly <laughs> while you like, get out of breath? No, they're going to hit you. Uh, was that the guy who did the fake, the, like, the fake journal article? Uh, they, this is... they submitted a bunch of nonsense to a journal. Oh, I don't know if that's the I same. I think it was I, that guy, Peter. It, 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 well, his name is Peter Canellos. Oh, it's look, a different guy. Yeah, it's oh. a different guy. He's probably also you, there. Uh, he does not, I mean, if you, if you do go Google image search for Peter Canellos, he does not look like the type of guy who could murder anyone on a bus, despite it, his, you know, martial arts training. It's just like, okay, assuming he does get one person to the ground and takes their back and is holding uh, like a blood choke, like a rear naked choke for a long enough time to kill someone. Is everyone on the bus just like patiently waiting in line for Peter to beat the other ones up? <laughs> yeah, they're going to beat you to death. You can't yeah. fight off all those guys. Yeah. Like 9-11 would have worked like that if that's how it worked. They wouldn't have had to bar shut the, the cockpit or any of that shit. They would have just learned jujitsu for two weeks, killed everyone on the plane, and then flew it into the buildings. Yeah, it just, it's, it's just such bad advice. Like the idea, the idea that like jujitsu is like it's like a real fight at all. Like, it's very useful for fighting, but I'm sorry, in a real fight, you can't just, like, get on your back and do a helicopter sweep to someone. They're going to kick you in the fucking head. I think it's, I think it's, I mean, I think it's important that the guy said that, like, uh, jujitsu is very important for intellectuals, because I think that's kind of how they, it's, it's not good enough to just, like, present your arguments and be an intellectual. Like, the true test of debate is, can you, like, you know, uh, put someone to sleep uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a hold or something like, can you break someone's arm easily as you're talking about how affirmative action is one of the great atrocities of the 20th century? Well, when people say that, what they mean is like this annoying, uh, annoying uh, phrase that people would use for jujitsu. It's like a human chess match, you know, because uh. it's, <laughs> it's, it's so, it's so intricate and you have to think so many moves ahead and, you know, it's so involved and like don't they actually do that though aren't there real <laughs> human chess matches where they're on a chessboard there are, yeah it happens I but like, like, that's, more actually, like that's one of the few chess. varsity athletics it, offered by the university of austin <laughs> is human chess oh that would be great yeah but like jujitsu being that cerebral it's true on like a high enough level like if you're so good at it that you're not just you know acting on pure adrenaline and then running out of gas while you do it yeah, sure. But that's not what these guys are. They have like 30 seconds of go in them. And they're not like, I'm sorry, like you, I don't really think you can really say that you're good at jujitsu until you've done it for like a decade. You have to have actually killed a bus full of people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I need proof that you did that. I want death certificates. But I feel like, what is it about jujitsu that like leads to this kind of like, I remember like, I, I swear to God, like uh, another, another guy I knew who like uh, started doing Brazilian jujitsu, uh, like said after studying it for some time, like he advertised it in the same way this guy did to me by saying, it gives me comfort to know that any room I can walk into, I can physically dominate any man inside of it. And I'm just thinking like, is that the way you think? Is that is, is that the yeah. way you think when you enter a room? You're just like the Terminator, like sizing up who here I could best in physical combat. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. <laughs> Which man in here is a sub that I could dom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I I think like I think very broadly, right? That not all men, but a lot of men, at least when they're growing up, like in their adolescence, do have like this um thing lurking in their consciousness what, like what would happen if i had to fight this guy or this guy any man they come across right and hopefully you get that out of your system you stop thinking that way by the time you're an adult or even by the time you finish high school hopefully yeah for me it's just run between their legs <laughs> 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 but but like the reason, Careful, the reason Alex, if someone if someone extends their arm and holds your head they completely they can completely uh neutralize any any attack that you may uh, offer oh there's a jujitsu move for that <laughs> <laughs> but the, like the reason that any type of fight training is good is because like if you're if you're a man who thinks that way you have this fear your entire life that like someone's gonna beat you up and you'll you'll like have to kill yourself or kill them or something because it's like, you know, it's like they violated you. 
But once you train and you realize that you suck and someone does dominate you, you're like, oh, okay, that like wasn't that bad. Like, I'm not very good. Okay, and I can learn to get better. And hopefully that that gets that kind of thinking out of you. Hopefully after that, you don't go into a room as an anti-woke professor and go, oh, my God, would I be able to fucking kill uh, Brett Stevens? Yes, is the answer to that question. Yeah, actually thinking about that room. I'm thinking <laughs> about those people. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, ho- ho- hopefully uh, once you graduate from the University of Texas, uh, Austin, you'll be able to enter a room and just wonder, how many of these men could I be friends with? I think that's, I think that's a healthier mental attitude to have. But uh, Peter, the, uh, the, the jiu-jitsu fighter, uh, so it goes on with him. It says here, oh, wait, no, this is a different guy. Pa- uh, Pano Canalos, president, stood up. It was time for the opening remarks. Our chatter lulled, and he began to speak in gentle, benevolent tones. He told us that we weren't starting a university. We were a university. This is what a university looks like. People coming together for conversations, much like the one we'd been having over our complimentary chicken dinners. Dialogue, he said, from the Greek logos, two rational beings engaged in, engaged in rational discourse. He smiled. We smiled. And with little further ado, he introduced Peter, whom the other students had not yet had the good fortune of meeting. Peter, Pano told us, was kicking butt in the righteous name of freedom. Peter springs to the center of the room. The air pressure changes, a buzz, a hum, a current about us. He brims with a frenzied energy. Something is happening. He is going to give us a taste of what's to come, he says. This is the kind of intellectual activity we're going to experience at the University of Austin. We're going to grapple with big issues. We're going to be daring, fearless, undaunted. We're going, he says, to do something called street epistemology. Oh, <laughs> street, oh, oh, yo, it's the, the, yo, the street off. sophist is in the house. Uh, and like, yeah, it is basically what you'd imagine. What is street epistemology? He'll demonstrate. It's one of two things he does, he says, the other being jujitsu. <laughs> Oh, fuck. Oh, Jesus Christ. I, I'm beginning to understand why this guy uh, needs to train himself to have the ability to kill any human being he encounters because what he does is just annoy people on the street. So he says here, I don't have a life, he says. I talk to strangers and I wrestle strangers. Shut but before the we fuck can do street- up. <laughs> Aren't you a God, professor I or something? Hate that. I, 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 isn't this guy it. supposed to be a professor? I, what do you yeah. You're going out on the this. street beating people up? I hate this so much. I hate it when someone does, like some fucking old guy does jujitsu for like six months and they think they're a Brazilian named Pythagoras Moeller. You're not <laughs> fighting for your next meal. Shut the fuck. Like any junior varsity lineman would beat you up. Shut up. Well, they do get a chicken dinner. <laughs> That's a phrase so, yeah. I haven't heard since 1922. <laughs> when you get a winner. chicken dinner. Winner, winner, street epistemology. So he says, uh, so he says, okay, he's going to demonstrate what street epistemology, he says. Uh, But before we can do street epistemology, Peter needs to think of some questions. He turns his back to the audience, hunches slightly in strides, stroking his chin. He is Rodin's thinker set in manic motion. He is a relentless uh, logician in study at, in his study at midnight. He is frantically a, a frantically philosophical gremlin. Bam. He wheels around and stalks forward and slings his index finger out toward a student, demands of him whether climate change is real and how certain is he and why. Bop. He points at another student, asks whether gender is a social contract, whether whether it's trans women or women. He cites Socrates and the seven habits of highly effective people. (laughs) He staggers and weaves as a boxer dances. So Peter lectures. He is the professor you never had. He is a skull of raw intellect. He is Robin Williams in the Dead Poets Society, but ripped. He is putting a gun to the head of your most precious assumptions. And then it is over. That, we have learned, is street epistemology. Is he asking the hard questions of another and not refuting them when you disagree, but continuing to ask why and how certain are you until the temple of their convictions crumbles and you can help them build a newer, sounder one? Man. Uh, I got to say, uh, the, the, the Spartans, and they didn't do many things right, but making, uh, making <laughs> Socrates kill himself is probably the one good thing that they did for history because I can't stand yeah. this Socratic method bullshit. Yeah. Oh, well, and mean, he they, did it on purpose for attention. Okay. He was like a proto saint. He was like, yeah. "Oh, don't, don't make me kill myself. Oh, I don't want to <laughs> die for my beliefs. No, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to live in infamy." That's, it. I mean, like killing yourself back then was kind of a wash because, like, what is being alive? Yeah, oh, he would have no. been dead by now anyway. 
Yeah. Oh no, I don't. Uh, no more amazing years sleeping on my stone bed in my house that's just a bunch of columns and no walls. One thing uh, I do notice is that they're clearly doing affirmative action for Greek people. <laughs> Because all these people are Greek, and it's because, oh, it's the academy, it's classical. It's like the human version of putting all those pillars in in the White House and the Capitol building. Yeah. It's like a reference. Oh, we got to get all these Greek guys. I see what you're doing. <laughs> and uh, with street, street epistemology, you can also, after, after you intellectually dominate someone, you can engage in fraudage with them as well. Uh, going on, it says, there were other classes. The psychology of morality with psychologist Rob Henderson, a would-be Jordan Peterson. Science and Christianity with geophysicist and IQ fetishist Dorian Abbott, whom you could hear say things like, I hate feminism, a grin, a grin twisting on his face. Anglo-American grand strategy in which some 20 young men listed, listened to historian Walter Russell Mead explain how the West had gained geopolitical supremacy over the past 300 years. You could enroll in only one of the four forbidden courses, but I heard about Anglo-American from my roommate at the Hilton Antonal, Ralph. He was an excitable young man from the Midwest who'd been a poll worker and a middle school math teacher. His plane to Dallas had been delayed, so I didn't properly meet him until the evening on the second day. I walked into the hotel room and found him staring out the window. He turned as I walked in, then turned back to the window. Whoa. Oh, man, look at this. It's a huge pool. Below us sprawled the hotel's Jade Waters Resort Pool Complex. There were slides in a lazy river. Do you think we have access to that? I didn't think so. Dang. We talked about four schools of foreign policy, Hamiltonian, Jeffersonian, Jacksonian, and Wilsonian. He told me after the first day of classes. We listened to songs. That was great. The songs were a reflection of each school. He liked Merle Haggard's Oki from Muskogee best. It represented the Jacksonians. He pulled it up on his phone. <laughs> That's so stupid. What, what, what are the way? I need to know the song that represents Wilsonian uh, foreign policy. Oh, I don't it's, think uh, you John would. Lennon's it's a Johnny Rebel song. Yeah, it's song. something about uh, <laughs> Mammy and the Plantation. It's something you can't play on the radio anymore. The two Wilson songs are, yeah, like, you know, Song of the South, Johnny Rebel, or, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, that uh, Klaus Schwab music video that some uh, <laughs> right wing guy made. <laughs> That is one of that is so stupid. Jacksonian ideals through a song that came out in the sixties. <laughs> like what, what are we doing? And how is that different than Jeffersonian? What's the difference between Jeffersonian and Jacksonian? Also, didn't Merle Haggard write that song essentially to make fun of the point of view he was giving voice to? Yeah, I I also like I just I like how the this ostensibly is supposed to be like a very a very heady pursuit you know we're only doing this because there's no more real learning at liberal colleges but then they are doing the equivalent of rolling rolling the tv out yes for the <laughs> yeah, for the every reading, class for the slow it's just class high school <laughs> yeah. yeah like the anglo-american supremacy of the last 300 years that's just regular textbooks from when we were growing up <laughs> yeah, yeah. well like, not I, anymore, I, I don't Alex. think that was like that much better it didn't make me yeah. like a a better person than the no, kids like today where they have a part where it's like it was very bad what we did with manifest destiny the trail of tears was really bad <laughs> Like, is that, oh, oh, they're not going to, they're not going to be fully functional humans. They're not going to be, they're going to kill themselves for being white because there's a page about the trail of tears that they yeah. also didn't read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel like when I was reading this, I just thought like I had the exact same thought that every single class at the University of Austin is when the substitute teacher wheels in a TV and you watch like a National Geographic documentary or for when yeah. I was growing up, uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom for some reason. Oh, man, there are some unjustifiable things that teachers show kids. Uh, in sixth grade, we had a teacher show us pay it forward. And even, <laughs> and even as like an 11 year old, I was so fucking mad. I was like, this has nothing to do with learning. This is just stupid. I think we were showed the Indiana Jones movies because they had some semblance of historical fact in them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The, the part about how, <laughs> yeah, the part about how Indian people eat monkey yeah, brains. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, I mean, that'd be that'd be good at the University of Austin, you know. A, a, I guess a, a so. Classic view of the Indian thuggy culture. <laughs> at yeah. the University of Austin, they still have those National Geographics with the ladies with their tits out in Africa. 
<laughs> you can still look at those during recess. <laughs> uh, okay, go, going on here, it says, uh, one student, bravely reviving the pseudoscience of physiognomy, said that if your index finger was longer than your ring finger, that probably meant you were gay. This is literally the uh, shit. Not gay, not gay, not gay. Yeah, if you, if you put your hand over your face and it covers the entire face, that means yeah. you're gay. Uh, yeah, uh, an, another brave Forbidden Courses lecturer uh, asked to induct students into the Pen15 Club. I can't believe that's what they're teaching. Yeah. <laughs> Physiognomy, you can just make shit up. You can just say whatever. <laughs> Uh, someone else claimed that 20% of Gen Z identified as LGBTQ. There's no way a society can evolve, can evolve if 20% of its population is gay, another student added, shaking his head. Is it really only 20%? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was like 40%, honestly. <laughs> well, what, what, what is this going on? There is, there is simply no way a society can evolve if 20% of it is gay. Well, what, what do you I mean, mean evolve? Start checking index fingers now. Do they mean evolve in the Pokemon sense? <laughs> They're never going to beat that gym leader yeah, if there's all these yeah. gay students. We're going to uh, so now. Like, we're getting Raichu if you guys uh, keep having gay sex. And also, they want to go back to ancient Greece. Yeah, when 100 percent of people were gay. Yeah, it says uh, evolve. Evolve in this case seemed to mean stay the same or turn back the historical clock. Later, another statistic was cited: seven percent of France is Muslim. Yeah, Pierre replied. That's probably because they don't want to integrate. <laughs> That doesn't, that doesn't make what sense. What are you talking about? Sense. What are you talking about? Uh, they integrate if you just get off their ass. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. just want to play FIFA and shit. <laughs> what are, like, what are, Give it a couple decades. What are they supposed to do? Are they supposed to join the French religion of like being a Catholic atheist? Of not yeah. showering? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Having narrow shoulders and marrying your yeah. daughter's friend. Casting off the church and then having to having to re-embrace it out of weakness. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the religion? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, going on here, it says, uh, this is a different paragraph. Uh, the room set the mood. Sunk in the basement of a building modeled after Monticello, the debate chamber gets no natural oh. light. No matter, it is not dreary. What with the electric skylight glowing yellow and blue overhead in an eternal artificial sunset? What with the walnut walls and the 75 seats before white oak desks with inlaid leather tops? Wait, so they're, spending all the, they're spending all their money on fucking uh, on, on, on lighting design and uh, oak desks. There's no way to run an academy. Did they really it, recreate Monticello? Yeah. <laughs> that seems kind of woke to have white people build it. <laughs> <laughs> like paying white people to yeah, build that that seems yeah. like that's not historically accurate and uh, also what, one thing about jefferson that i always think about is that he was he he got closer than anybody in american history to having white slaves <laughs> that was basically his project was to have like seven eighths white slaves that you could legally <laughs> enslave so when like it's, it's kind of a weird <laughs> counterintuitive thing <laughs> He was he was basically trying to find a loophole to have white slaves, and he did. I well like that. So, so I don't know if that's woke or not. That's how that's how much of a genius. Jefferson that's a forbidden was. idea, right there. He, that is that is truly, truly is. a forbidden idea. That's, he was such a genius. He foresaw you know guys who walk on the shoulder of the highway, and thought, "I have it. Do I have a job for them?" <laughs> yeah, they're growing teeth for me. <laughs> but listen to some more about the interior decoration of of this place so it says a uh, artificial sunlight blah 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 inlaid leather tops all oriented around an imposing stage uh and then it also includes a naturalistic painting of julius caesar getting stabbed to death on the ides of march you feel teleported into some grand old political past into the roman senate say, as depicted in Spartacus or Epcot, summer 2004. And if you need to leave to use the bathroom, you'll get to pass by a massive oil painting of George W. Bush making the hand of the benediction in front of the wreckage of 9-11. Okay, that's cool. I, I mean, like that, I, I think that's, that's a very cool idea for a painting. Or beside a Madonna figure whose halo glows, I shit you not, with the Coca-Cola logo. Oh, God. Is that oh, Banksy? my God. Yeah, yeah. No, this is all the art is like yeah, sub bank right wing Banksy. Just use classical art. Yeah, why exactly? Don't make new why, art. Don't, why don't they just have actual like like classical artwork or painting here? 
why the, why this like neon statue of the Virgin Mary with a Coca Cola logo and a and like George Bush at nine eleven doing the benediction? It's so easy to get an amazing looking Blake painting where it's like a a, a demon. He, William Blake was woke though, so yeah, I guess so. That's the problem is but most of the historical artists labor. they were woke in some way. Yeah, because unfortunately, most of the Western civilization it came out of urban centers from highly educated people <laughs> who were uh, who were engaging in all the the frivolities of life. And it wasn't like the the rural peasant in the Von Day. Going on to some of the uh, the speakers, first up, Kevin D. Williamson, a big oh, uh, old boy. friend of the show. We love Kevin. I'm glad he's doing it. The writer in residence at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I forgot wearing, about that guy. <laughs> yeah, I forgot yeah. about him too. Um, he was wearing a salt and pepper beard, a pink shirt, and blue tie. He riffed on the topic of journalism for 30 minutes. He enjoined us to read the Bible and said, get yourself an eighth grade grammar book instead of a journalism degree. He suggested, he suggested usefully that we learn something about something. He threw in a few zingers. For instance, the Washington Post published boring, dry, sterile articles, and Bernie Sanders was not as crazy as he seems. He was actually a lot crazier than he seems. Williamson shared some surprise, some inspiring historical factoids like the people who wrote the Constitution. These people didn't have law degrees for getting the 32 framers who were lawyers. <laughs> yeah, I think they were all lawyers. You had to be a lawyer to be president until like 1900. Up next, Mr. Seth Dillon, CEO of the Babylon Bee, or The Onion for Evangelicals, as New Yorker writer uh, Khalifa Sana has nicely put it. Uh, Dylan spoke about canceling comedy. The evening of the second day, scoffing at opposition to punching down in comedy, he raised his eyebrows, leered, and smirked. He demonstrated an impressive command of alliteration. Nothing, he said, undercuts lunacy and lies like laughter. He licked Elon Musk's boots, exclaiming that the world's richest man took matters into his own hands, bought Twitter, and declared comedy legal again. In his beard and suit, he was a spectacular man-child. So he's giving, I guess, a comedy writing seminar here. Comedy's legal again. Thank God for that. Delivered with uncanny hypersensitivity of a bad actor, Barry Weiss's speech was a jumble. On the one hand, she was careful to assert her, assert her identity. I'm gay. I'm Jewish, she began. On the other hand, she praised University of Austin for being a place to separate identity from ideas. <laughs> <laughs> uh. On the one hand, she made good use of the freewheeling frontier imagery that is popular with tech heads like Joe Lonsdale, saying that we're living in a time that requires new pioneers, such as the good people who enter the Wild West world of podcasting. Thank you. <laughs> I've, been, I've been, I've been, I've been a don't fucking homesteader. Yeah, <laughs> I've been a homesteader. I think we're at about here. like 1890. <laughs> <laughs> the bankers have moved in. Yeah. The railroad has been constructed at this point. Everyone's yeah. getting on this fucking racket. I would say that we are like the Wild West character Steve from Deadwood. <laughs> He'll be I, teaching can, one forbidden chorus. Yeah. Can I just say that I hate that um, there's like a tech guy named John Lonsdale because you hear that name and you're like, that's one of the Watergate guys that got 15 years and converted to Christianity. That's a, he has such a Watergate name, but no. Is G. Gordon Liddy still alive? No, I believe so. No, Let I don't. I think I thought he died like in the last few years. Oh yeah, twenty twenty one. He, he could have taught at that college. Okay, he had a radio show for so long. He was just around forever. His radio he show taught rolled. a course. His radio show actually was forbidden ideas because it would include things like if you shoot an ATA edge and aim for the head because they usually have a vest on. <laughs> that was his forbidden course. Yeah, it's crazy that he was on the like, radio. I mean, yeah, there, like I said, none of these forbidden ideas are being talked about at the University of Austin. Um, the ensuing, okay, so it says here, uh, the Wild West world of podcasting. On the other, she told us that we also needed the genuinely safe space that University of Austin provides, disregarding that the University of Austin's academic programs manager had recently promised the school would permit no safe spaces. In the ensuing Q&A, however, at least one person in the audience evinced disappointment. This student asked Barry Weiss why a school that promised constructive debate had failed to invite any speakers who were left of center. Weiss had difficulty with that one. Perhaps because it so plainly points to what most attendees knew but blithely kept unspoken. University of Austin quite clearly embraced some truths over others, and the discussion it fosters are like the, those that might take place at the Hoover Institution or a right-wing message board. There was only the most superficial range of opinions and ideas held. Almost all the speakers droned on smugly about the same points. 
DEI is ruining higher education. Women's studies and ethnic studies are worthless. Gender ideology is destroying America's social and moral fabric. IQ is the best measure of merit. These positions have as have as their, their end the maintenance, the naturalization of existing race and class hierarchies. Inviting speakers from the left would pose an obstacle to that naturalization. I mean, like, yeah, like a, a dangerous idea at the University of Austin would be like to have someone who's against Zionism speak there or teach a course. Yeah, that's one of the dangerous ideas. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a that's dangerous the, uh, idea. That's yeah. sort of the unspoken thing, <laughs> the, the difference between the intellectual dark web that you can write about their dangerous ideas in the Atlantic and uh, Richard Spencer. And, and Nick Fuentes, the, the, the difference is one specific country and one specific religion. That's the only difference. So whether yeah. sh- Should we throw them in the minority pile or not? Uh, of what did virtue consist? Throughout the week, University of Austin speakers had provided some examples. <laughs> Mocking trans women and the value of diversity, lauding IQ as the ultimate metric, and doing lip service to debate but failing to practice it. But the greatest models came on the last day when Joe Lonsdale and Mark Andreessen, zooming in from screens set up in the debate chamber, discussed the future of artificial intelligence. Lonsdale is also one of University of Austin's founders and helps fund the school. Before university, before university of Austin had received official nonprofit status, it was sponsored by the Lonsdale-created Cicero Institute, a conservative think tank that proposes free market solutions to public policy issues. Again, what a dangerous idea to talk about in the 21st century. Free market solutions? I, I have never, yeah. and there's no, not a single university will touch that, that sticky wicket. I hate this shit because it's like the Heritage Foundation exists. Like why? Yeah, but why like does there old need people. to be another one of these? Yeah, no one wants to be a Democrat. No one wants to be a liberal, a centrist, any of that shit. There's got to be a new word for it. We need to rediscover the same shit over and over again, but find new terms for it. <laughs> I'm I'm privatization maxing. <laughs> <laughs> or the uh, actually the uh, the generally uh, the the genuinely forbidden idea that I've heard come out of Heritage, but unfortunately not the University of Austin is uh, a a recent speech that they gave where they promised the end of recreational sex. Hmm. (laughs) That plays well with people. (laughs) This is a broad... Recreational is such such a fun word for it. (laughs) This is populism. Uh, Going to the end here, it says, uh, Lonsdale with furrowed brow and beady eyes played talk show host to Andreessen, who resembles nothing so much as a hard-boiled egg. The two That guy used to follow me for like three days. Yeah? Me too. What, what causes I was like unfollow? 18? I don't know. I never he, found out because I realized later. He's followed and unfollowed me like a lot. It's just, he's, he'll follow me, then unfollow me, then follow me, then block me. And I'm, I'm just never interacting with him. I don't know what's up. <laughs> Why well, is like I look at him, my shit? He has $10 billion. Yeah. I, I Why like, are you on the computer? It makes me feel like, I don't know, like I'm, I'm taking Ambien and maybe I'm like sending him my dick every night and I don't realize it. <laughs> I like delete the messages. Why is this? So, what's happening? He's telling everyone in his life about being sexually harassed. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the best ending. I'm so sick of this guy. <laughs> be the best ending to my career to get me too by Mark Andreessen. Yeah, I mean, I, it's like... Uh, I think that's about it on the uh, the University of Austin, Texas. I mean, I, I'm impressed that they even had this little seminar. I, I thought it was never going anywhere, but best of luck to them and uh, the 30 students that they're, you know, educating in forbidden ideas. I guess, lastly, before we go, uh, let's thing I want to talk about. Did you guys see the uh, the libs of TikTok, Taylor Lorenz interview? Yeah, I think every every fight that people have should have each person wearing a t-shirt of the other person crying. <laughs> yes. I like yes. that dynamic. <laughs> well, Alex, Alex, I swear to God, when I first saw the video, I thought Chaya was wearing a t-shirt of herself. Yeah, they look the same. I thought it was like, like Bernie Mac, you know, like Def Comedy Jam. She came out with a, a pants. She's dark with Taylor Lorenz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, she, she really is. But I don't know. I just, uh, I, I was struck by uh, just how absolutely brain dead Chaya was. Like, I it just like, to, to be pushed to be pushed to like not even defend her ideas but even just to describe them in words she seemed to like trip over herself and yeah. show taylor a, fo- a photo of a blowjob on her phone she seemed like on pills or something she seemed very like low register i don't know it's was, it was very very odd she made one of the best excuses i've ever heard uh like she you know just completely stumbles fucks up entirely comes off like an insane person and then she's like of course taylor lorenz put this out 
on a Saturday when she knows it's illegal for me to use phone. <laughs> that shit's so weird. Oh, come on. Both of them do that shit, too. Yeah. Where they're both like, like, you know what you're doing. Like, you're trying to make a career off of tearing this person down and, like, digging into their shit. Like, we all know what's going on. And then the second you do it back to them, it's like, you you posted my last name? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. She's you posted me. a picture of me? <laughs> yeah, it's like hey, you're both famous. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah, with with uh, with um Chaya, it's just like the Sabbath. You mean Saturday for everyone else? <laughs> like, yeah. I'm sorry, I've never heard yeah. of I've never heard of reporters doing like a courtesy blackout of news on Saturdays. You have to have I a Shabbos Goy to send them the emails. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we should. How do, they, how do you believe that people are supposed to respect that? That you just don't work on Saturday. That's some millennial shit to me. I mean, it's I'm a lazy millennial Saturday shit. Either. You can't. E- oh, I don't want to be emailed on the weekend. I don't want to be. E- <laughs> Shut up. Do your fucking job. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. You know, are there pedophiles in schools or not? If there are, I don't want you to the see game you stop. just yeah. taking, taking a day off. Oh no. <laughs> Yeah, th- th- their kids are being r- every kid is being raped in every school, uh, but I can't email you about it on Saturday. What? <laughs> yeah, give me a break. You think God doesn't understand that shit? I, I, I yeah, no, Alex, I, I do love that when 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 Shia talks about like anytime someone writes an article about her, there she's being doxed. Yeah, just sh- yeah, shut the fuck up, lady. Like, you want to I mean, be this famous. is your job. This is your job. But yeah, you want to be famous. I do. This I do the wanna- most famous you're ever gonna like. This is. <laughs> This is the climax of your life. I, I got to say, though, I, I, I wearing wearing the T-shirt with Taylor Lorenz crying on it was pretty cool, though. I think Does I, she I, sell I guess, that. I mean, I, she should or Taylor. I mean, Taylor, honestly, Taylor, Taylor needs Taylor to sell, sell one it. of her crying. <laughs> and I don't think there is one because she's smart enough not to give your enemies pictures of you crying. But yeah, you could Photoshop one. No, I'm just I, I'm thinking. Yeah, like Chaya should just go like the Bernie Mac route and just have a full outfit with like Taylor Lorenz's faces all over it. And and a map of Africa. All right, so let's uh yeah let's uh, that's good buzz it does it for today. I think we'll wrap it up here for today. Um, till next time, everybody. Uh, do we have anything to plug at the end of today's episode? No, we're all good. Well, then uh, uh just make sure to check out Alex on Chapo FYM. Yeah, check and that Fortune out. Check out Kid. WFYM. Check out Fortune Kit. I do music with Charles. Links will be in the show description. Alex, once again, always a joy to hang out with you. Thanks for filling in today. Awesome.